Welcome once again into the Radiopedia Reading Room, a podcast unconcerned with books or poetry, tea leaves or palmistry. It is but a humble radiology podcast. My name is Andrew Dixon and joining me in one millimetre thick slices with a 10 millimetre gap is my co-host, Frank Gaylard. I see what you've done there, Dixon. You thought that I wouldn't understand that you were referencing an HRCT. Oh, oh very good. Very yeah. good. I'm old enough that we, we did skips. Do we still do that? Probably not, right? They're all volumetric. I don't know. We're talking about things we don't understand, so we probably should move on. But today we are indeed venturing below the clavicles for a bit of interstitial lung disease. When was the last time you reported an HRCT chest? Actually reported it or asked someone else to report it for me? You know, actually reported it yourself. Uh, it's, it's, it's been a while. Occasionally, I mean, I still have to do general CT sometimes, but I have a very low threshold to pass anything below the clavicles or in front of the spine to someone else. <laughs> I think it's been seven years since I since I reported one once uh, once we went completely subspecialized in our department I haven't had to haven't had to sign one off but I do take a weekly infectious diseases meeting and so HRCTs will come up in that so I just throw out a few buzzwords like ground glass tree and bud air trapping a few acronyms UIP and <laughs> SIP <laughs> a bit of uh, non-specific. Oh, it could be drug related. It could be infection. It could be aspiration. It could be rejection. <laughs> Throw these things out. They seem they seem impressed most of the time. If they give you grief, you can always bring out case base. Like, oh yes, that artifact, uh, you know, is is due to the helical pattern of filling case base. I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah, and move on to the next case very quickly after that. No one ever asks a question after that. You'll be pleased to hear that. People have been listening to the podcast, Frank. We've received some feedback. We've received uh, five-star reviews. Oh, excellent. We like those. But the main feedback came from my Radiopedia 2023 co-conveners who berated me for not mentioning the fact that the R poster abstract submissions for Radiopedia 2023 are due coming up uh, on the 28th of February. So if anyone out there is making your educational poster for the conference, uh, get to work. You just have to make seven example slides that includes the title slide uh, and the learning objective. So really five content slides as examples. And then if your abstract is uh, selected, you get a DOI citation, you can get a certificate and the chance to win an award at the actual conference. So get those in. Today's episode is a chess radiology panel discussion from Radiopedia 2021, hosted by uh, Radiopedia editor Sally Ayessa and featuring thoracic radiologist Jonathan Chong from the University of Chicago Medicine and Miranda Shemenovich, who's from the Alfred Hospital here in Melbourne. Uh, but before we listen to that, Frank, I have some sad news related oh to this panel. It, uh, it turns out that your favourite meat-inspired radiology <laughs> sign is no more. You're not, you don't mean head cheese, do you? I am indeed talking about head cheese. That, that's like 50% of my residual HRCT knowledge is gone. <laughs> the preferred term now is the three-density pattern, referring to that combination of ground glass, normal density lung, and then areas of low density from air trapping that you see in hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Do you know why we don't call it head cheese anymore? Politically incorrect? Uh, I don't know. Maybe people just didn't know what head cheese was. <laughs> they didn't know it wasn't a cheese. <laughs> yeah. For people who don't know, do you want to explain what it is? Isn't it some sort of uh, sausage or like salami sort of small good made out of the bits of meat taken from the head of a pig and <laughs> all bound together with gelatin or something? Yeah, it's like some kind of terrine kind of thing. When you cut the surface of it, it does have those kind of multiple areas of different density. In other meat-related news, <laughs> this is going to be a regular segment on the podcast now. Oh, gosh. I recently wrote a post on my... Um, Oh, I don't know what you'd call it. It's not a vanity project. I, I do projectalice.org, which is... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, on Patreon. Uh, yeah, it's a Patreon where all the funds go to a radiology across borders as a donation. And it's just a place for me uh, before this podcast that I can vent and show people what I'm working on. And I wrote a post recently on um, Impossible Meat, which is one of these meat substitute. It's yep. soy-based. And the thing that makes it look like mince is heme that is obtained by genetically modified yeast. And that's what gives it the meaty flavor. I've always had a, a, a difficult relationship with meat. I'm pretty sure that it's the single most 
ethically dubious thing I do on a regular basis, eating meat. But at the same time, I tried to be a vegetarian for a couple of years or a year and a half, and I got really fat and I was doing it badly. Now, I I know this is just that I did it badly, but it really didn't work out for me. But so I tried this thing and it's pretty, pretty good. Like I tried it as a hamburger. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I would have noticed that it wasn't mince. And last night, in fact, hot off the meat press news, (laughs) uh, I tried bolognese sauce with this impossible mince. Did the kids eat it? Yeah, the kids really liked it and they knew that it was not real meat as well. Um, Yeah. It's still not as nice, but, uh, you know, no animals were harmed. I've tried the one, I think it's called the Rebel Whopper from (laughs) Hungry Jack's. For people who aren't from Australia, Hungry Jack's, I think, is the equivalent to like Burger King or something. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, so they've got a Rebel Whopper, which is, yeah, the meat-free version and it tasted pretty good. I mean, I don't like the Whopper normally, so <laughs> I didn't know what to compare to, but it was all right. One interesting aspect of the meat versus not not meat debate, people often obviously think about the, the rights of the animal and pain and suffering, things like that. Another thing that I find interesting is the, the calories produced per acre of land usage because we're really r- running out of land as a precious right. resource in the world in order to feed people. And plants generally are more efficient in terms of producing calories for the amount of land that they take up. Beef's pretty bad. Like I think I've got the stats here. 1.1 million calories are produced per acre. I think that's per year compared to potato, the humble potato, 17.8 million calories per acre. Yep. But interestingly, soybeans are less efficient than pork. These kind of issues are so complicated. The moment you start yeah. to dig into it, it's, you know, not all land is the same. Absolutely. And how do you equate the suffering of one chicken compared to one pig? Are they the same, for example? I think at the end of the day, it's a bit of an Alara principle, you know, as low as reasonably possible. No, that's not right. As low as reasonably achievable, Gaylord. <laughs> Otherwise, it'd be what? Alara up? Um, <laughs> anyway. I suspect listeners aren't here to learn about meat alternatives, so we better get into the chess discussion. So this is hosted by Sally Ayesa. It features Jonathan Chung and Miranda Shimenovich. This chat happened straight after Jonathan had just given a lecture on hypersensitivity pneumonitis and Miranda a talk on diseases of the pulmonary lymphatics. Both lectures are available in our chest imaging lecture collection over on the website. So let's listen in and then Frank and I will be back at the end for another chat. We're now joined by the speakers from the two lectures that we've just watched. Watching the lectures myself, I really enjoyed them. And I know that for a lot of radiologists and trainees, interstitial lung disease is a really challenging topic. And I enjoyed how you both broke it down and related it back to the anatomy and the pathophysiology of of the processes to kind of make those concepts stick a little bit better. My first question is for Miranda. In your lecture, I know that you really, I thought, quite successfully rebutted the notion that sarcoid can look like anything. And I know that for me personally, when I was training, that was always one of our catch cries. It's like, oh, sarcoid can be anything. So I was wondering, with your trainees and even with your colleagues, how do you approach and challenge this concept? It's a a real bugbear of mine, this throwaway sort of habitual cry of sarcoid can look like anything because um, in reality it can't because there is a pathophysiology behind the disease And when you appreciate that pathophysiology, you appreciate that there is going to be that perilymphatic distribution. So there is going to be this this sort of these few hallmark features that are going to come together each time. And what I go through with my trainees is the classical cases, the classic nodular sarcoid, which has that really easy to spot from the other side of the room, mid and upper zone, peribronchovascular nodularity, and then contrast that as we come across cases that show those less common manifestations of maybe fine fibrosis, but it's still mid and upper zone and it's still peribronchovascular, or more coarse fibrosis, more end stage fibrosis, and you're still over and over and over seeing those other classic features. So that mid and upper zone predominance, that peribronchovascular distribution, and then if you lose those two quick gets of the mid and upper zone, and maybe it's a basal predominant disease, maybe it's more conglomerate masses, or maybe it's, um, it doesn't have any nice discrete nodules to, to clue in with, then you're looking for those other features. So the septal thickening, that micronodularity, that fine granular gritty appearance, these other sorts of things that you come across to try and put that together. And there is 
almost always something there that gives the game away. So getting your eye in for those really easy gets of the distribution and when they are not there, then those morphological features. I love just bringing up these cases as we come across them in the reporting pile and bringing the registrars around and showing them and proving time and time again that there are these features. It's a disease that has a number of different typical manifestations, but it's not just anything. I just wanted to reiterate that I completely agree. Sarcoid, they say that sarcoid can look like anything, but sarcoid looks like sarcoid, right? I really <laughs> I really think it does. Um, certainly there are those challenging cases in which perhaps it doesn't read the textbook and has a little bit of an atypical presentation. But if you got your thinking cap on and you're really analyzing the images with a high level of detail with the understanding that you are dealing with some sort of odd interstitial lung disease, it's not just some infectious inflammatory aspiration or pneumonia, it might be something special, uh, given sort of the symmetry of it. I think a lot of times you can figure out start point. Uh, one, one of my colleagues, that, and I, I'm just going to steal this from him, I'll give him a shout out. His name is Christian Cox. Uh, we used to work together and he would always say, even for those hard cases of sarcoids, he would say, it's sort of like those hard cases are like, um, like mastermind criminals. You know, they'll leave clues. Sarcoid will leave clues that it is sarcoid. Again, it may not be classic, but if you look carefully, have your thinking cap on, very often as a radiologist, you can make the diagnosis. So I love that part. I love that too. My goodness. I think I'm going to have to take that and steal that myself, but of course I'll reference you as well. So <laughs> that, that actually probably leads on to another question. So I know that both Jonathan and Miranda, you talked um, about the fibrotic stages of hypersensitivity, pneumonitis and sarcoid especially. And Jonathan, you did kind of speak about how it was quite difficult to sometimes diagnose in those later, later stages. And it's more tricky to pull apart the fibrotic phases rather than those, you know, early phases when they've got some of the more classical features. Can you think about why this is so and how does the, how, what's your experience with other interstitial lung diseases in kind of pulling it apart and really analyzing those patterns? It's, it's, it's challenging. I think um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis is a nice example of interstitial lung disease diagnostics in microcosm. So very often in, in non-fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, you have enough findings there where you could probably make a high confidence diagnosis based on imaging. Obviously, you need to correlate with the patient's clinical presentation and their occupational and history as well as their other exposures. But just based on the imaging with non-fibrotic HP, you look and you say, oh, wow, that's, that's textbook. I think that's patient is hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And eventually it turns out the patient has it. As opposed to a lot of cases of fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, it doesn't follow the, the classic sort of pattern that you hear in textbooks. A lot of times it's not upper lung preponderance. A lot of times there isn't any air trapping. And I think the reason why that is, is that why well, it's more challenging really to make a diagnosis of fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis is that over time, a lot of these different interstitial lung diseases as the fibrosis, fibrosis gets worse, they start to run into each other. They start to look like each other in terms of their, their CT phenotype. And that could certainly be challenging. And so, uh, yeah, the, I mean, I guess the analogy that I, I talked to my, my residents about, so when you have a brand new car, you have a you know, Mercedes versus a Toyota versus a, a Hyundai, you can just tell, it's like, well, that's a Mercedes, right? That's a very nice car. That's a Hyundai, that's not as nice of a car, you know, these kind of things. But if you were just kind of leave them out and they were, they were you kind of let um, nature take its course and the metal started corroding, the, the, the interior, um, the upholstery started getting torn up, just kind of let, you know, uh, the natural history of, of sort of like, I guess, destruction, right, of, of, of things that sort of tear down things, um, take its course. After a while, I mean, after 20, 30 years, they all start looking the same. And the same with fibrosis. With fibrosis, there's only certain ways the lungs can go. The lungs aren't really that malleable in terms of their end-stage morphology. So if at end-stage fibrosis, 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 whether it came from HP, whether it came from IPF, whether it came from connective tissue disease, toward the end, they all start running into each other. And that's what I think is going on. But I mean, Miranda, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right, Jonathan. And I think that running together of the end stage disease process is, is the, what we're looking at. And we see that corollary played out histopathologically as well, because we know that when um, the pathologist sees the lung specimen from a wedge biopsy or from an explant after lung transplant, when it's an end stage lung, it pretty much looks like UIP and they've got fibroblastic foci and they've got end-stage fibrosis and all of the different histopathological entities that were occurring in the lung 20 years ago 
um, 10 years ago, five years ago, have run together histopathologically as well. So I think I think that's a, a, a really true statement and really sort of a fundamental underpinning of interpreting fibrotic lung disease because the clue is often in an earlier study. When you've got an end-stage lung and you're, you're discussing that in an MDM setting, you go back five years and you say, ah, oh, but actually yeah. this did look like this IP because I see the subpleural sparing five years ago. Um, so now I can tell you that this is... Uh, fibrotic uh, predominant NSIP, um, but the clue was five years ago rather oh, than yeah. now. You know what drives me crazy is so I'll be I'll be uh, sitting with one of my residents looking at a case, and they will have looked at sort of the the most recent case and maybe the most recent comparison, and it's an interstitial lung disease case. And I tell them, why did you not look at the early like it's, there's a CT scan from seven years ago? And I tell them that is radiology gold, right? That's really the scan you want to look at. <laughs> Yet for some reason, you know, you, you, they get so you know, a little bit of tunnel vision and then we look at the most recent studies. And I understand that. I was a resident. I understand that you, just the logic is that, well, the most recent studies must be the, the studies that have the most data in them. But you're to, so right, totally right. The earliest studies in ILD, very often, those are the ones that really are the gold, that, that give you the diagnosis. So true. And I think that's that's just a process of sort of deduction and uh, interpretation that you learn that's specific for interstitial lung disease. And it's, it really comes into its own in chest imaging um, compared to other body systems. And when we're all learning how to be radiologists and, and learning how to, you know, what's, what's important, where the evidence is going to come from and how we're going to support a diagnosis, uh, we learn what the toolkit is. And, and that's what it is in chest. That's what it is in ILD, oh, yeah. really going back in time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean that's what I love about ILD. ILD is so different from other types of sub disease settings, even in chest imaging, where it, it, the first thing that blew my mind was when someone told me that in ILD pathology is not the gold standard. When someone told me that, I was just, what are you talking about? Right. And they showed me the paper, that classic Flaherty paper back in like 2003. Wow. wow has it been that long, almost 20 years ago, but they showed me the paper and they're like one out of five times, a pathologist will change his or her diagnosis based on multidisciplinary discussion. And after that, I was like, all right, I got to do this. You know, so, <laughs> as, you know as, a, as a radiologist, right? You oftentimes you you, you sometimes you'll, you'll trump the pathologist. And I said that will never happen in any other field. So I need to do that, right? Also, though, you know, the the imaging patterns are so you know just um, you know so beautiful. Some of them, right? You yeah. know, so aesthetic. Something about it sort of resonates in my my brain and my soul. So uh, I had no choice but to <laughs> ILD. I found my people. I think. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. But no, there's we, something so beautiful about ILD. I think it's just incredible. Sure. <laughs> we're so lucky because we get an overview of the entire lungs so the pathologist is limited usually to a wedge biopsy specimen sometimes a cryobiopsy which yeah. is even smaller um, and they're looking at one little tiny fragment of the overall disease process and when you're talking right. about heterogeneous involvement when you're talking about temporal heterogeneity when you're talking about um, differential severity of involvement in different parts of the lung the radiologist is the one that actually has all the information I guess that brings us to a bit of a discussion about kind of stagings and classifications. I know that, Jonathan, you spoke a lot about the new staging for HP in your lecture. But, Miranda, just kind of flicking to you first, I know that sarcoid has, we have the staging system, you know, stage there up to stage four. And I also do find with a lot of exam candidates and registrars, they get quite hung up on the staging system. I was wondering in your clinical experience, how important is that staging system and do you use that with your referrers? Yeah, so the the staging system that Sally's talking about, of course, is this zero to four where zero is normal and one is within the uh, mediastinal lymph nodes and um, progresses on to involve the lung parenchyma and finally stage four is fibrosis. And uh, the sort of utility of that staging system is to conceptualise the expected progress of the disease in that the earlier stages are more likely to spontaneously regress. And the um, stage three disease, which is um, lung parenchyma limited, but without fibrosis, and then of course the fibrotic stage four um, are much less likely progressively uh, as, as the stages go on to spontaneously regress. But in clinical practice, the staging system doesn't correlate well with clinical um, disease. So uh, lung function impairment, quality of life, uh, and actual degree of symptomatology. And it's the symptomatology that drives the patient care. What we find in our MDMs is that we're looking at extent, we're looking at change over time, 
and um, we're correlating that with the patient's symptomatology. That's another sort of unique way of assessing imaging in interstitial lung disease, which is that the radiological input is the course over time so often that may, they may know that the patient has sarcoidosis, but um, when we come to the meeting, we're saying, okay, well, actually, um, you've seen a, a radiological progression that was then followed by regression with treatment, um, or there was a spontaneous regression over time. And telling that chronological story is another element of um, the unique interpretation that we give in assessing radiology and interstitial lung disease. So, so it's more that pattern over time correlation with the clinical symptoms rather than this um, sort of uh, numerical and sort of attractive because it seems so objective uh, system of, of applying a stage number. Jonathan, is that your experience as well? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're on point. I have nothing to add there completely. It, it is it is attractive. As radiologists, we're used to like either putting calipers on things right? Or grading or staging things. That's just what we do as physicians and as, as people who, who visually evaluate things. So I see why people are inclined to do that. But yeah, from a practical standpoint, probably not that helpful. I guess that kind of brings into the new um, classification system for um, for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And I have to say that I'm actually kind of devastated that we're no longer using head cheese as well. I, I just, I love it. <laughs> like It's just such a, an elegant kind of food related way of, um, of putting things together to make it stick into the trainees' minds. But are you finding that now that you've got the guidelines for hypersensitivity pneumonitis and also the ILD guidelines as well, how do you end up kind of choosing which way to go down with those? Like, especially if there's a bit of overlap and you're not quite sure where to clinically land. So that's a hard question. Hard question, but I really think it's about pretest probability. And I think that depending on what the pretest probability is of IPF versus hypersensitivity pneumonitis, that's really what you start with. At University of Chicago, we have a lot of IPF patients and UIP for one reason or another. And so if I know nothing else, it would make sense for me to start with the IPF diagnostic guidelines. But I talked to some of my other buddies who live uh, closer to farms or medical centers are closer to farms, or for some reason, they just have a higher rate of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And in those patients, in those settings rather, it makes sense to start maybe with the HP diagnostic guidelines, if that is the majority or the plurality in terms of the ILD process there. But Miranda, what do you, what do you think? What do you do with this? Um, well, I think what's interesting to reflect on with the guidelines is that they're not mutually exclusive. So you've got any one study and the imaging characteristics can be classified along the UIP, IPF classification system and in, in parallel classified along the CHP classification. So you might have a study that's um, indeterminate for UIP but compatible with fibrotic HP and then in the MDM setting the clinical background of the patient comes out and you discuss, well, they grew up on a farm, but actually they haven't been there for 25 years and they only got short of breath in the last five years. So never mind the farm. And the UIP, IPF classification system supersedes and we give them a provisional diagnosis of low confidence uh, IPF. The approach is not mutually exclusive and a robust multidisciplinary discussion is um, what ends up finally hanging the the diagnosis, the working diagnosis on the patient. And maybe something else to, to reflect on there is that the working diagnosis in ILD is never fixed in stone. So these patients come back, they get reviewed again, they get um, the trajectory of their disease gets reassessed by the clinicians and we're questioning ourselves all the time. Well, we're still happy with that diagnosis that we've given them. Are they behaving atypically for it? Is there something else we need to think about? So um, that's, I think, part of the sort of flexible and um, ever-evolving interpretation required in assessing interstitial lung disease. You know, that, that makes me think about how is the U.S. different from Australia in how an MDD is run? Like, do you guys, so I'll, I'll tell you, at University of Chicago, and I think this is pretty standard across the U.S. and most academic centers, we'll have meetings maybe once a week or maybe once every couple of weeks. And then you have a bunch of pulmonologists come, sometimes a rheumatologist, or very often rheumatologists, definitely a pathologist for the pathology cases, and then at least one radiologist. Is that sort of how it's done in Australia as well? Yeah, just like that. So we have, um, so I, I work at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne. So uh, we run the largest lung transplant service in the Southern Hemisphere, and we've got a big ILD uh, referral basis as part of that. We have weekly ILD meetings attended by two thoracic radiologists when we're both around. And the respiratory physicians, pathologists, we have an immunologist who regularly attends. And 
that's the forum that these patients are discussed. So, yeah, absolutely. And for each case, we put up the clinical background, we put up the lung function tests, the results over time, discuss the radiology, all the available radiology pulled from either local imaging or external providers as well, um, and then go through algorithms down the sort of confidence, um, low confidence, high confidence, uh, where the imaging feeds in, what other information have they had a bronchoalveolar lavage, uh, and then record the working diagnosis from there. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds amazing. That's like I mean, really the gold standard. Is that is that standard across Australia, like like um, like all the cities, or like all their medical centers, or is, is yours really an example of really the aspirational gold standard in Australia? Um, well, we, we, we try to be the aspirational gold standard. Our methodology for running the MDM um, was published in the Asia Pacific Society of Respirology. Um, huh. as the uh, sort of template approach to running an MDM. That's a, a big point of local pride that's come out of our department to, to really stay on top of the evidence base and, and stay on top of all of these working guidelines. So it's personally very exciting to me to be able to chat with you, Jonathan, as the one of the authors from the um, HP paper from last oh. year that we use every single week with all of these patients. So um, it's certainly the, the MDM is a bit of a professional highlight of the week here. So. That's amazing. I'd like to thank the two of you um, so much for your insights, your discussion. Um, I've personally learned a great deal and I feel very honoured to have shared the virtual stage with you both. So thank you so much. We're now going to continue on our advanced chest imaging session with a lecture by Craig Hacking on the imaging of acute aortic syndromes. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you then. There you go. How was the uh, passion and expertise in that discussion on display there? That was awesome. Thanks to Sally, Miranda and Jonathan for sharing all that with us. Uh, you can find Miranda's pulmonary lymphatics and Jonathan's hypersensitivity and pneumonitis lectures in our chest lecture collection on the website. Any thoughts following on from that discussion, Frank? Uh, one really quick thing that stood out was the analogy of end-stage disease to a rusting car. Yeah, the rusting car. I like that too. That was good. I think that's a, a really good mental image of, of what's going on. And, and I think it's really important when looking at any disease process that is towards the later stages, that it can be really hard to know what's going on. Things do tend to end up looking similar. And going back to the earlier studies is, is true of, I'm sure, any subspecialty. It's certainly true for neuro where how a disease starts is often more important in narrowing the differential than how it ends up later on. So I think that's a really good mental image that I'm going to steal. Yeah. The other thing that stood out that, that's a bit of a hobby horse of mine is um, getting annoyed about statements like sarcoid can look like anything. Because the reality is most diseases have variable presentation. There are very few diseases that only present in one very pathognomonic way, uh, particularly when you're talking about these sort of systemic diseases. I mean, a ureteric calculus is a ureteric calculus, but mm -hmm. sarcoid, whipples, vasculitis, lymphoma, gliomas. See how I'm going back to brain because they're the only things <laughs> I know. <laughs> but, you know, they all have very variable presentation. And, and to just say sarcoid can look like anything and, and put it on every differential list kind of misses the point that different diseases have very different distributions of presentation. And you need to have a sort of Bayesian approach to how you approach your differential list. Jonathan raised that as well when he was when he was talking about in my setting here in Chicago, we don't have a lot of farmers versus in other settings they may have exposure. And then he uses that kind of Bayesian approach in determining whether something's more likely to be hypersensitivity pneumonitis or not. It's that kind of idea of pretest probability as well. Yeah. And the other thing that comes up when this idea of pretest versus post-test probability uh, in, in radiology is I think some radiologists, particularly trainees, sort of bake in the, the Bayesian thinking into their conclusion, but don't make it obvious that that's what's happening. So as an example, I remember being rotated out to our nuclear medicine department 
And uh, there was a VQ scan, which was, as they often are, sort of indeterminate. And uh, we um denied looking at this little segment of maybe mismatched perfusion. And then uh, the nuclear med physician wandered out and went to the patient. And they said, oh, hi, Doris. How are you feeling today? And she said, oh, you know, my, my chest hurts. Oh, it does it. Yes, every time I breathe in, it hurts. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Have you been on any long trips? Oh, yes, I came back from New York, you know, and my calf hurts. And then I strained and I suddenly got this pain. And then he went back and looked at the VQ scan again and said, oh, yeah, I think it is high probability. And you can't roll that information into your conclusion without making it clear where you're changing your likelihood from. And really that conclusion should have said, although the VQ scan is indeterminate in the setting of blah, 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 blah. And and I think doing that really helps separate out where you're getting your certainty from. There's there's one thing that I often do in neuroradiology, which is you might say the diagnosis based on patient's age and solitary lesion is most likely X, you know, glioma. However, you might point out an unusual feature and say, however, it does demonstrate, you know, Y, which may suggest another condition. And then you might follow that up by saying, recommend short interval follow-up or or whatever. But that approach of, I know based on pretest probability that it's most likely going to be this, but just as an aside, there is this other feature, which is more typical of another condition. It's rare, but I'm going to mention it. And if you craft your conclusion well, then it has the added benefit that it'll look like that's what you were thinking regardless of what the diagnosis comes out as. Absolutely. If it comes back as a glioblastoma, well, that's what I said first. But if it comes back as that other condition, if you're like, yeah, I told you I thought it might be lymphoma. One of my old uh, head of departments, Brian Tress, was a master of doing this. His conclusions were always a work of art such that regardless of what it ended up being, it always looked in retrospect as if that's the thing he was favouring. But I think it can be different to a hedge, right? It's just going, look, based on probability, this is most likely, but I just note this other feature. Yeah, absolutely. It's also useful because those kind of differentials are often given to the pathologist at the time of biopsy. And that can be really useful for them to do the correct ECR or stains or markers. Well, the pathologist is actually the other thing that I wanted to talk about from this panel discussion. Jonathan mentioned that, you know, one of the reasons why I fell in love with chest radiology is because often the radiologist makes the definitive interstitial lung disease diagnosis rather than the pathologist. Um, And I I agree, you know, probably is something that happens more frequently and routinely in chest radiology than other areas, but, but it does happen, doesn't it, outside of the chest. Examples that come to mind for me that the idea of the don't touch lesion, the, you know, myositis or civigans doesn't need a biopsy because if you look at it under the microscope, it might get misdiagnosed as osteosarcoma. The idea that pathology is or histology is the gold standard. I just don't like the word gold standard because it implies really good standard. Uh, And this is not having a go at pathology. It's having a go at the, the term gold standard because often the best test you might have is still really rubbish. And there's a very different attitude between pathologists and radiologists in that pathologists kind of expect and are expected to give a final unequivocal diagnosis. And it's very rare that you read a histology report that equivocates or hedges. But when you talk to pathologists, often there is uncertainty in the diagnosis. Whereas radiologists, we somewhat err too far the other way of being so aware of the fact that it's not definitive and being worried that then pathology won't agree, that we don't back ourselves as much as we often should. And not doing that means that sometimes when the pathology opinion is incorrect, it doesn't get questioned as much because we haven't stuck to our guns. Yeah. We better wrap things up. Uh, How can people get in contact with us, Frank? Well, we are at Radiopedia on Twitter and Instagram, and I'm on at Frank Gaylard, and you're at Dr. Andrew Dixon. Did you put the doctor in there just to make your parents proud? I don't know why (laughs) I put that in there, but it's there. 
Um, and you can also email us at podcast at radiopedia.org with any ideas and feedback you might have. Actually, that reminds me, the email reminds me that in two episodes time, Frank, uh, we're going to be testing out some interesting radiology themed interview questions on each other. So we want to develop a set of, you know, uh, get to know you type radiology themed questions that we can then use in future episodes uh, when we're interviewing our guests. So if you have any suggestions for questions that might work really, really well, then please email them into us. Yeah, something like, what's your favorite meat derived product? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Just a whole lot of meat related questions is what we're going to do. The other thing that's worth mentioning is that if you want to help support Radiopedia, then you can become a paid supporter via the website or you can purchase an all-access pass to our online courses and conference. And many, if not all, the lectures that uh, are mentioned in these panel discussions are available as part of our lecture collections. And and what else can people do, Frank, to help out? And, of course, <laughs> you can also help out by leaving us a review in the podcast app of your choosing. Yeah, my wife, she's a massive fan of the podcast, by of the way, course. doesn't at all think it's a waste of time. Um, she says we should specifically ask for five-star reviews. Apparently, that's oh, what okay. people do, okay? We don't want anything any less than five stars, and Frank, you're not going to turn up next week, okay? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, let's let's leave it there. Uh, I'll do the sign-off now. We've, this is embedded into the show. This is always going to happen, and we'll catch you all again sometime soon in the reading room. Bye. Mm-hmm.